it's lovely to be in wonderful Copenhagen. Um, I'm honoured to have been invited out of my retirement to take part in this very important meeting. It's particularly important for me because I felt very lonely in my battle against screaming over the last 20 years or so. Um, the title of my talk is Thinking Fast and Slow, Strategies for De-Implementation of uh, Screening Cancer Programs. Um, the idea for the title came from this wonderful book by Daniel Kahneman, who won a Nobel Prize. Um, he is um, an expert on the psychology of decision making. And um, he postulated that there are two ways of thinking, thinking fast and thinking slow. Thinking fast is happening all the time and it's intuitive and it's something to do with survival that we have to think fast and make intuitive decisions. Thinking slow takes effort and is not intuitive. And he illustrates this in his book very early on by um, this question, this puzzle. A bat and a ball cost one dollar ten cents. The bat costs a dollar more than the ball. How much does the ball cost? Now, about 50% of MIT undergraduates get this wrong. I will tell you the answer at the end. So don't waste time trying to work it out because it takes effort and it doesn't work on intuition. Now, coming on to my subject, with every new group of medical students, I always used to tease them by asking the question, why do we screen for cancer? And I always got the same answer, catch it early, sir. They used to call me sir, by the way. <laughs> Later, they called me Mike. And I would then, in false grade, say, wrong. Because that is, if you pause to think for a moment, instead of thinking fast, think a bit slow, catch it early. Early is a chronological term. What they mean is catch it small. So I argue, if you have a cancer that's one centimeter, and it's been there six weeks or six years, which would you prefer? And after a moment's thought, the students say, six years. I said, yes, that's hardly early, but you would be wise to choose a one centimeter cancer that had been there for six years. And already they are starting to think slow. <laughs> Another way of putting it is, um, by H.L. Mencken, I love this quote. For every complex problem, there is an answer that is clear, simple, and wrong. <laughs> Catch it early for cancer is one of those ideas. I know what I'm talking about in this subject. That sounds awfully conceited. But in 1987, uh, following the Forest Report, I was given the task, together with Professor Heather Nunnery, the radiologist, of setting up the first national screening centre for the southeast of England. And this not only offered screening for the district we lived and worked in in Camberwell, near to King's College Hospital, but we had to train all the experts in that part of southeast England. And we completed the work on time, on schedule, and opened this first screening centre in a, a shopping centre uh, called Butterfly Walk in Camberwell near King's College Hospital. I rapidly became an expert, but I was a bit different to all the other screening experts in that I knew about screening. I also ran the National Cancer Cancer Research Campaign Clinical Trials Center. So I was somewhat numerous, but I was also a clinician. I was picking up the pieces. And 
it didn't take long to me to learn firsthand the problems of screening. Suddenly, we had an epidemic of that past them in situ. We picked up a butterfly walk, and the woman would come to me, and the good news was we've caught it early. But the bad news is you've got to have a mastectomy. Why? Because it's multifocal. Well, I don't know what that means, doctor. And I said, well, frankly, I don't know what it means. I <laughs> so, firsthand, I discovered overdiagnosis, and then, together with a young colleague, we wanted to see just how big the problem was. And seven years, after seven years, we went to the um, Cancer Registry in London, and to our dismay, we learned that the incidence of cancer had shot up over the last seven years, and there was a 20% increase in the incidence of in situ cancer, and we expected a, a fall in invasive cancer, but the incidence of invasive cancer had got up as well. And we thought this was wrong. We could not believe ourselves. Sadly, it meant we weren't the first to publish on this, even though I claim to be the first to have noticed this. Now, the problem with screening is it is very much based on intuitive thinking. We assume that there is a linear <coughs> mathematical model, or log linear, if you like. Catch it early, save a life, and save your breasts. And that over a period of time, in situ cancer will progress to early invasive <coughs> cancer will progress to uh, later invasive cancer, which will then metastasize. Now, when we set up the screening system in the UK, it was done in good faith on the available evidence. But then other counter evidence began to emerge, and these are the classic data the Jürgenskern and Gershka uh, showing what happened in the UK following screening. Those that were too young, the incidence were made plateaued. Those in the screening age group shot up. And then when we extended the age, it shot up again. So in the young, under 50, there was no change in incidence, but in the screen detected age group screening, there was a sudden increase in incidence. Of course, we can't discuss this subject without mentioning uh, Lyon Welch, and this is their classic paper from the New England Journal of Medicine about the effect of three decades of screening on ma of mammography. And I think you've already seen this diagram before. This is the age group not invited for screening, early stage, late stage, plateaus, and here's the age group invited for screening, early stages shoot up, and that's in situ and early invasive, late stages remain the same. They deduced from these observations that in America, 70,000 women were overdiagnosed each year, and in the UK, I made the calculations uh, based on UK incidence and population, and I uh, figure that 14,000 patients were overdiagnosed annually in the United Kingdom. The <coughs> Marmot report in 2012 was set up in order to shut us up. There were more and more people arguing that screening is not all that is made up to be, the benefits are exaggerated, the harms are ignored. And they tried to come up with a compromise. I think Marmot's a good guy, again, acting in good faith, and like the BBC, wanted to hear the arguments from both sides equally. And came up with a conclusion uh, which was taken up in the Times, keep having scans despite the downside women are told. So that was in the Times. And what outraged me, I had completely spoiled my breakfast, was they found three women, I'd be dead without the scan. So three, three women were of the opinion that they would have died if they hadn't had early diagnosis. But that was the top people's paper at the Times, or what I read, 
And this is the bottom people's paper, uh, the Daily Mail. And uh, this is me, to screen or not to screen, where I argue for every woman saved with breast cancer screening, to ensure unnecessary treatment. And one expert calls for greater caution. That's me, I'm the expert. <laughs> and we were able to find one woman to side with us. Doctors Railroad did me into needlessly mutilating body, mutilating my body. So we had only one anecdote to support my argument, three anecdotes to support the other argument. Very, very difficult to achieve balance. Now, we all know what overdiagnosis means, and here's a high power magnification of that carcinoma in situ. And the estimate of overdiagnosis for the Cochrane report in 2009 uh, was uh, for every breast cancer that was avoided, 10 women will be overdiagnosed and overtreated. Well, the Marmot report came down with a less frightening number. For every breast cancer that avoided, three women will be overdiagnosed. Now, where they got that from, I don't know. How they calculated that number, I honestly do not know. It is not transparent. But one thing I do know, that panel was not completely independent because it was advised by the cancer czar, Michael Dixon, who is a screening zealot. Nevertheless, I did some sums. I modeled the trade-off in the benefits and the harms of screening, the harms being the overdiagnosis and overtreatment with radiotherapy and chemotherapy, and of course mastectomy, and published this paper in the BMJ. And these are the summary, this is the summary of the data I came up with. Remember, this is modeling based on the best available data, accepting the most conservative estimates from the Marmot Report. <coughs> right, so accepting the type of radiotherapy that was used at the time the trials were conducted, I calculated that the relative risk of death from lung cancer was 1.78, and the relative risk of uh, death for myocardial infarction, 1.27 amongst women treated for radiotherapy. Against that, and allowing better treatment since the trials were performed, I estimated that three to four women out of 10,000 screened could avoid dying from breast cancer, assuming that the relative risk reduction was 15 to 20%. Against which, three to nine uh, per 10,000 screen will die from lung cancer and myocardial infarction. But this is modeling and concluded that it was a close call. I uh, subjected to quite a lot of abuse, and it is suggested that, that my chances of a knighthood went up the spout, and uh, my wife has never forgiven me. She always wanted to be Lady Judy, but no chance, no chance at all. <laughs> now, that's modeling. I've got some new data to show you, which is not modeling. It's from a randomized controlled trial. So this isn't modeling. Um, about 20 years ago, my group started a clinical trial of intraoperative radiotherapy. We've invented a new technique of delivering radiotherapy into the tumor cavity only treating the tumor cavity and a centimeter beyond it. The device is called, now called the intravenous manufactured by Carl Zeiss, and it generates um, electrons that accelerate down this tube, gets a gold target, and then gives soft x-rays in a spheroid within the cavity at the time of surgery, but only within a centimeter, uh, rapid attenuation. And we did a trial. We compared what we call target risk adaptive radiotherapy with external beam radiotherapy, conventional 
external beam radiotherapy, one size fits all, and compared a single dose of intraoperative radiotherapy versus standardized fractionated radiotherapy, which takes three to six weeks daily visit. And this was a big trial. 3,451 patients randomized from 11 countries around the world, and the data were published twice in The Lancet. I want to focus on the screen detected group within this large cohort. And a large majority of these patients were, in fact, screen detected. Here, here are the other uh, demographic and risk factors show. But look how many were screen detected. Look at the overall survival of this mature cohort, the majority of whom were screen detected. You look at that and you think, well, is this cancer we're treating? There's only about four or five percent of the women dying over this 10 year period of follow up. You see a curve like that, you begin to question whether you are treating cancer, because no treatments I know are that good. And here we have the key message. Notice the Captain Meyer curve is turned upside down and the maximum level is 4%, so it goes up this way. So breast cancer mortality, these two lines, the green and the dotted, are there, identical in both arms of the treatment. But non-breast cancer mortality, uh, this is um, target, and that's external beam. So there is a significant excess of mortality from non-breast cancer causes, mostly myocardial infarction and lung cancer, as a result of whole breast irradiation in screen-detected patients. These are no, not modeling data. These are actual data for randomized control sharks, which confirms the estimates we made modeling it. Now, it's difficult to believe that's true. There's that survival curve. But the very, very first randomized trial I organized was called CRC1, Cancer Research Campaign 1, where we compared patients having mastectomy with and without radiotherapy. It's a very old trial. It was launched in the um, early 1970s. And here's a paper from the BMJ in 1989. And um, look at the median survival at f five years. So it's not median, it's a five-year survival. 70% of women, either irradiated or not irradiated, die of cancer. That's nothing like I've shown you with the screen detected population. But I want you to look at this deaths from other causes. And we were the first to show that radiotherapy to the chest wall is associated with an increased risk of myocardial infarction. And if we just focus on that, that's deaths from myocardial infarction mostly. And the line we've seen for the overall survival in the screen detector group is above there. So we have disclose the risk of dying for myocardial infarction <coughs> and lung cancer if you irradiate effectively normal women. <coughs> right. So, the meaning of overdiagnosis is the fact <coughs> that there are flaws in the hypothetical model. That is the hypothetical mathematical model. It is false. Cancer, particularly breast cancer, does not behave in a linear or log-linear way. DCIS can resolve spontaneously or stay like that. How we know that is another lecture. Early invasive uh, breast cancer might start off as DCIS,
and some of those will just remain latent or as picked up. Others may progress. So the issue is complicated. At every stage of evolution, there are a number of pathways that lesion can follow. So in other words, we are not dealing with a linear subject. We're dealing with a complex organism, the cancer, living, nesting within a complex organism, the human body. Um, this I acknowledge to Dr. Adler. He disguised breast cancer as three types, turtles, bears, and grenades. And that only takes you a little bit of the way. But it implies that we can stratify breast cancer into slow-growing, rapidly growing, and very rapidly growing. That's a step along the way to understanding the flaw in the contemporary model, but it is still wrong because it implies each one of these cancers has a trajectory which is predetermined and is linear accordingly. I uh, believe it's not just me, there's a, a huge body of evidence out there. In fact, we've now convened ourselves into a group called uh, Cancer Complexity, who are convinced that cancer is not a linear problem. Cancer is chaotic, using the chaos theory to explain it. So here's my model, simplistic model, of what I think is going on. Here's that carcinoma in situ. And it exists in a state of dynamic equilibrium. And it may regress, stay as it is, or progress. And the triggers to make it progress are as yet unknown. It then becomes invasive. Some of these lesions may become invasive. And in becoming invasive, they induce vascularity. And once vascularity has been induced, then over time, cancer cells will be shed and establish metastatic foci. These metastatic foci can exist in a niche in somewhere in the human body, but they can be latent, and they can be latent for a very long time and ultimately provoked to become progressive in their own way. So this is a very simple explanation of a mathematical model of complexity based on chaos theory. All this has been published and it's been published again and again and again, so much so that I'm beginning to believe it myself. <laughs> so this is a complex concept. How do we explain it to our governments and our lay public. To get the governments, it's politicized. So I think we need to be able to explain this in such a way that it's part of think fast instead of think slow. So it doesn't take too much effort to understand what I'm saying. And the example I would use is weather forecasting. Every evening we see diagrams like this, and we see isobars for pressure, attracted young women getting excited that it's going to be a wonderful day tomorrow, or um, if by five o'clock it's going to rain. Lay people understand that uh, weather forecasting is, a is forecasting a complex system. So, effectively, what we're saying is a cloudy analogy. We have small clouds. We know that small clouds don't grow into big clouds and then grow into huge clouds that rain upon us. The weather forecast will advise us whether to take out a sunshade or an umbrella. But there will come a time when it's pretty self-evident we've got uh, 
Nimbus Clouds. <laughs> uh, this is the Thames, by the way, and uh, that's City Hall. We haven't seen this for a long time, we've actually had two and a half months of non-stop sunshine, which has been going on for TV years. But when you see the weather like that, you, it's too late. Now, the weather forecasters are so accurate, within four or five days, it's amazing. We are nowhere near that with weather forecasting for cancer, quote, early cancers. Nowhere near it. What we do know is that up to 50% of screen detected cancers are overdiagnosed, and as a result of that, are overtreated, and as a result of that, die unnecessarily. The weather is not unpredictable anymore. But cancer is unpredictable, and we have to be honest with it. <coughs> right, the answer to this question, uh, how much does the ball cost, the, the back cost the dollar more than the ball? Uh, you have to think a little bit. Um, it's not that hard. It will be obvious when I tell you it. Um, the, um, the answer is five cents. Not ten cents. <laughs> because it's got to cost a dollar more. So it takes slow thinking to figure that out, not fast thinking. The trouble with overdiagnosis and screening is we're thinking fast. We're thinking intuitively, and it's not common sense. This is an obscene, infuriating invitation <laughs> for screening. It, it's frankly not funny. Because this is meant to be for women with learning difficulties. <coughs> we managed to get it with John. It is disgusting. And uh, in fact, as it happens, um, uh, Down syndrome women don't get breast cancer. But the idea of caveat emptor no longer is acceptable. The purchaser should not be aware. The purchaser is our patient, and there is a duty of care. It is now not only ethical, but mandatory that women or people being invited for interventions, therapeutic or screening, must be told everything that we know and let them make an informed decision. But to make an informed decision, we have to teach people to think slow. Thank you.